Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg touched down in New Jersey today, making it official. Construction on the new Portal North Bridge will finally begin. The 110-year-old original rusting span has been a bottleneck for rail service into and out of Newark Penn Station for years. And it's a critical piece to the broader gateway program that will eventually double rail capacity between between New Jersey and New York. Senior correspondent David Cruz was there for the groundbreaking. One, two, three. You know it's a special occasion when they bring out the golden shovels. And so it was today as Governor Murphy, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, the state's two senators, half the congressional delegation all gathered to break ground on a new portal bridge. An event 100 years in the making. This is the best way I can think of to start a Monday morning. The worst way I can think of to start a Monday morning is late to work. And for so many commuters, it has been difficult to know that, that you could count on our 111-year-old infrastructure. It is the very finest state-of-the-art engineering of the Teddy Roosevelt administration. But we need something different and something better. By now, you've all heard the stories of workers having to reset the tracks on the bridge by using sledgehammers. Every opening and closing is an adventure, and when you're on one of these trains heading to or from work or an appointment, fewer things are more frustrating. But a change is coming, said the governor, who noted that this was the fourth star-studded event they've held in the shadow of the bridge but the first one where he could officially say, Today is the day that the construction of the new Portal North Bridge, one of the most critical connection points along the entire Northeast Corridor, begins in earnest. And not a moment too soon, because not only is it long overdue, but in just the last few years, the cost of the project, now projected at just under $3 billion, has gone up a $1 billion. NJ Transit boss Kevin Corbett promised commuter relief in our lifetime. Before I wrap up, I just want to be clear that this will not be a 20-year project. The first tracks of this new bridge is scheduled to open in 2026, and I know quite a few of my fellow commuters who have that date marked on their calendar. All times approximate, of course, but there was optimistic talk of how the Portal Bridge project will be just the beginning of a greenlit gateway tunnel project that will increase commuter capacity and generate economic growth and do all the things that these public works projects are supposed to do. It was a celebration for incumbent House Democrats, but Senator Booker struck a more combative tone. This is not charity. This is investing in the most profitable region in the United States of America. For every dollar of infrastructure invested in a project like this, we're getting more than five back in economic growth. And so today I have to tell you, I just got to get it off my chest. I am so frustrated with other countries out Americaning us. We're the United States of America. This is New Jersey. We define infrastructure on the planet Earth. Not to be out america politics was very much on display here with most of the incumbent House Democrats making themselves available to take a share of the credit for an infrastructure project that promises to make commuting life a little bit easier. In Kearney, I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And there's even more reason to remind the White House of the state's proximity to New York when vying for more monkeypox vaccines. This weekend, Mayor Eric Adams declared a local state of emergency due to the monkeypox outbreak in New York City. The city now accounts for about 25 percent of all cases nationally. And Governor Murphy, while at this morning's groundbreaking, said, quote, we're not there yet. He doesn't foresee making a similar declaration in New Jersey. But as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, monkeypox vaccine demand is far outpacing supply. 
when you saw the line of people at the door, it was, it was absolutely amazing how much somebody wanted this vaccine. Ray Welsh wanted it and he got his first monkeypox shot Friday among the first hundred clients at Bergen Newbridge to get the vaccination. He's an advocate for folks with HIV AIDS and felt lucky to book a slot because the vaccine's in very short supply. New Jersey got just 2,800 doses in its first shipment from the federal government, divvied up mostly amongst five vaccination sites statewide. We were able to get allotted uh, 300 vaccines for this first go around from this most recent tranche. 300, though, that's not a lot. 300 is not a lot. I felt privileged, you know, and working in public health, I'm constantly around other people. It's very important because I know a lot of people who started going back out, going to clubs, going to the shows, going to all these venues in New York, which is the epicenter right now. There is an underlying fear with the community that they will be exposed. They will get sick. Jersey's monkeypox caseload today jumped to 155, up from 109 last week. New York, with almost 1,300 cases as of Friday, leads the U.S., which reported more than 5,000 cases nationwide. While anyone can contract the virus, cases so far predominate amongst men who are gay and bisexual. The problem we're facing right now is that this is not a sexual disease. This is a disease that is spread by touch, by human contact. In all likelihood, the strategy of just focusing on gay and bisexual men because the supply was limited is going to lead to a situation where it spreads more widely into the population. Meaning anyone can get it. The CDC's reported monkeypox cases in two children and a pregnant woman. Dr. Sananda Gar says symptoms include the pustule rash, fever and fatigue. An antiviral treatment called T-pox must be specially ordered from the CDC. They would have to um, order it per pay as they need it for every patient. This past weekend, we had someone in New Jersey within our hospital system who got treated. Monkeypox vaccines manufactured by a company called Bavaria Nordic. They're in Denmark and they're swamped by demand. The U.S. just ordered a half a million more doses, but the delivery date sometime in late fall, perhaps the end of October. Are we heading towards a vaccine cliff? The appointments are being filled in eight minutes, that there are lines endlessly going around the block for the vaccine, is that you have a population that is really um, willing to engage in a vaccination program, and we can't get enough vaccine out. That is that is such a missed opportunity. New Jersey is expecting to receive another 2,700 doses, but Governor Murphy's pushing the federal government to recalculate its vaccine allocation formula and send a lot more to New Jersey, noting its proximity to the monkeypox epicenter in New York City. But the vaccine shortfall remains acute. Critics charge U.S. health officials reacted far too slowly when the disease emerged. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it kind of feels like because a certain segment of the population has been isolated and pointed out again, that they stalled on this whole matter. It kind of feels that way. Some communities in New York reportedly are scheduling only one of the two required doses to spread the vaccine to a larger group not New Jersey. Bergen Newbridge is scheduling a second dose when clients get their first monkeypox shot, hoping to get more vaccine. In Paramus, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Adults under 50 will have to wait for that second COVID-19 booster shot. The FDA has decided against making it available for that age group this summer. It's all in favor of a new reformulated vaccine that will hopefully roll out in September, according to the agency. It's designed to give stronger protection against the Omicron subvariants, particularly that highly contagious BA5 strain driving this latest surge. Older Americans and people with compromised immune systems are still being encouraged to get double boosted before the fall. Across New Jersey today, nearly 1,200 new cases and two confirmed deaths are being reported. Scientists are also turning their attention to the lucky and rare individuals who have managed to dodge the coronavirus for more than two years now, while others not as lucky have been reinfected multiple times. So what can we learn from it? Dr. Martin Blazer, professor of medicine and infectious disease at Rutgers University, joins me now. Dr. Blazer, I guess my question is, is there something safeguarding specific people from getting this virus? Why are some people able to evade it while others seemingly get reinfected? 
Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Uh, there are people like myself uh, who have never been obviously infected with the virus, even though uh, my wife has, uh, my kids have, uh, et cetera. So either I've been lucky, I've just avoided getting infected, or I had an asymptomatic infection uh, because I have pretty good immunity from vaccine. For most people, we don't know the difference. Uh, so it could be one or the other. Is there anything linked to genetics, T cells? I mean, what do we know based on the research that's been done thus far? You know, there are some genetic markers about severity, but I don't think that they're really strong enough to make that kind of difference. I mean, we, you know, now by now, maybe three quarters of the people of the United States have have had obvious evidence of infection. So that other quarter of the people that, that's kind of a too big a group to account for by T cell abnormalities. That would only explain a few percent. Well, what about with this BA5 subvariant? Could that upend that, you know, roughly 20, 25 percent of Americans who've not uh, had the virus outwardly? Well, you know, the thing about COVID is that every time we think we're over it, there's a new surprise. And BA5 is one of them. Uh, we thought, you know, we were really through it. But this this virus is more infectious than all the other ones before. And it's possible that the next one, whether it's BA6 or BA7, will be even more infectious. So the virus is mutating to become more easily transmissible from person to person. That's that that's the that's the direction of evolution. And now, Dr. Blazer, the FDA is limiting second boosters in favor of boosters being redesigned for the fall to target the Omicron variant. What's your stance on uh, that position that the FDA is taking? Well, the, the FDA, uh, I'm not sure if it's the FDA or the CDC, but they've recently said that everybody who's over 50 should get a second booster and not wait till the new vaccine. We're hoping the new vaccine is going to come in September, but there may be delays and that September may be when the first people get the new vaccine, but the bulk of the people, it's going to be a while. In the meantime, BA5 is circulating very widely. Uh, at least 100,000 people in the United States are getting infected every day. And uh, looking at the death records, it's, it's still about 400 people dying every day in the United States. That's, that's, four, that's four jet planes crashing every day. Dr. Martin Blazer, thank you as always. Thank you. Happy to help. The drama continues in the state's capital city. Two of Trenton Mayor Reed Gashora's biggest foes have filed petitions to run against him in November's election. Council President Kathy McBride and West Ward Councilwoman Robin Vaughn are throwing their hats into the race. Both council members are frequent thorns in the mayor's side, voting to block or upend many of his initiatives. They were most recently no-shows to a special meeting called by the mayor to fill the vacant seat of ex at large councilman Santiago Rodriguez, forcing the meeting to end without a quorum. Vaughn is a controversial figure in Trenton who's publicly made homophobic and bigoted slurs. The council's been locked in bitter disputes over approving budgets and other programming for the city, so much so at least 27 candidates, including the mayor's race, have taken out petitions to run for office. It is expected to be a bitter battle. From the city council to school boards, both bodies of elected leaders are critical to setting local policy. School board elections are technically nonpartisan, but it doesn't mean political organizations aren't getting involved. A wave of new advocacy groups are sweeping across New Jersey and the country, all in an effort to elect more conservative candidates to the boards, transforming these typically sleepy races into anything but. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. The school is the backbone of your community. It's the most important building in your entire in your entire town. That's why Josh Aiken says it's so important for people to be involved with the local boards of education. His organization, Arise NJ, encourages parents to run for school boards. While Aiken says his group is not focused on electing conservatives, the organization was founded by GOP gubernatorial candidate Phil Rizzo, and Aikens has said in previous interviews that the goal of the group is to get more conservatives with more traditional values on school boards. Um, a few years ago, 62% of all school board positions went uncontested or unfilled. And that's actually how I got on. I saw that no one was running for the school board, and I, 
I just had people write me in. I just was appalled that no one was going for the school board. During the pandemic, as school board meetings went remote, more parents got involved as issues such as masking and vaccines became flashpoints among parents. Last Monday was the deadline to file a nominating petition to run for the school board election coming up in November. And while candidates are not identified by party affiliation, there's a move by some to elect more people with conservative views. It all starts coming out of the 50s and into the 60s where we lost academia, we as conservatives or as Americans lost academia to the globalist, socialist, if you will, to a leftist movement. Freedom Mayor and former congressional candidate John Flores supports having more conservatives sit on local school boards. He says discussing social issues like critical race theory, sex education, and the LGBTQ community have no place in the classroom. Uh, I, I personally find that to be a breach of family values and huge overreach by the institution of education. We forced religion, any, any understanding of a deity or family values have just been pushed out of education at all levels and replaced by the institution. And, and I find that to be very, very threatening to our way of life. As I said before, our role is to make sure that all the information's out there, differing viewpoints, by the way, you know, uh, things that, that some agree with, some disagree, and that'll flip on any given thing. All of that should be presented to kids in an age appropriate way. Sean Spiller is the president of the New Jersey Education Association and a member of the NJPBS Community Advisory Board. He believes school boards should reflect all kinds of views, but the idea that any thinking is labeled as conservative is frustrating. For us, it's about People who care about public schools should get involved at the school board level. People who want to see kids succeed. So we, um, while we certainly don't want to see uh, school board politics devolve into st strict partisan politics, there's room for all kinds of views on boards of education. The national organization Moms for Liberty also against discussing social issues at school. We reached out to three members of the Morris County Group and they issued statements saying, quote, parents continue to be concerned about the NJEA agenda, which touches on very sensitive topics. It's not that they're not um, for the LGBTQ community or, the, um, or CRT or anything like that. They just don't want some of that being taught in school. They want to address those issues at home. Right now, county clerks are in the process of compiling names from the nomination petitions in preparation for November's election. And we'll see if Flora and Aiken's recruitment efforts of candidates with more, quote, traditional values pays off. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Will the wages from your future job be enough to afford your student loans? It's a good question, and there's a new law to help figure it out. Rhonda Schaffler has the latest on an effort to curb student debt, plus tonight's business headlines. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, getting a college degree or going to a job training school can be expensive. And now there's a new law on the books that will help students understand exactly what they're getting for their money. Governor Murphy has signed legislation that aims to protect students from unreasonably high tuition rates. The state will develop performance standards for post-secondary education and would prevent schools from overcharging students for programs. Labor Commissioner Robert Asaro Angelo says no one should have to borrow so much for career training that they can't afford to pay it back once they're working at the job they prepared for. At the start of the state's new fiscal year on July 1st, businesses were socked with an increase in unemployment insurance payroll taxes. But the New Jersey Business and Industry Association's Christopher Emmyholt says the Department of Labor has yet to post information about the tax hike frustrating businesses. If you're supposed to start increasing the amount you withhold on July 1, and now we're four weeks later, we still don't know the answer, um, it gets hard and employers want to plan. Employers want to be able to be able to set out what their costs are, what their taxes are. The NJBIA says the state has an obligation to be much more timelier and more transparent with the state's employers.
Amazon reportedly has scrapped plans for a delivery facility in Galloway Township, Atlantic County. According to Press of Atlantic City, both Galloway's mayor and the owner of the property Amazon was interested in building on have said the project is not moving forward. Amazon wasn't immediately available for comment, but earlier this year, the online retailer announced plans to reduce its physical space and sublease some warehouses in New Jersey and other states. Now here's a check on today's stock trading. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by the Chamber of Commerce Southern New Jersey. Working for economic prosperity by uniting business and community leaders for more than 150 years. Membership and event information online at chambersnj.com and by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, helping to build a stronger, fairer New Jersey economy. In Ukraine, the first ship carrying grain from the port of Odessa departed this morning, part of a deal brokered by the United Nations to help ease the global hunger crisis. The U.N. Secretary General says it's the first commercial ship to leave the crucial Black Sea port since February, when Russia's war in Ukraine began. And the ship is carrying two commodities in short supply, corn and hope. That hope abounds here in New Jersey, where war refugees are making a new home. But as families tell senior correspondent Joanna Gagas, setting up a place to sleep is just one part of a tough equation. Do you want to go back to Ukraine? Very scared. Lyudmila Holovka fled to the U.S. as soon as the war in Ukraine started. She never dreamed she'd still be here living with her sister-in-law five months later, but returning is not an option. There are sirens all around and you never know when the bomb is going to hit. Holovka's husband and in-laws are still in Ukraine. She's scared for their safety, but now trying to make a home for herself and her four-year-old daughter Nicole here in the U.S. Of course she wants to work here, especially that she wants to make money so that she can support herself and her baby. She already gave her work authorization and TPS application in. Holovko was among the group allowed to apply for TPS or temporary protected status because she arrived in the U.S. by April 11th. She was also able to apply for work authorization while she's here, but the approval process can take upwards of six months. We applied for TPS. Uh, for all my family and work authorization uh, back in April, um, beginning of May, and we have not received yet nothing. Oksana Condon has been housing her family since the start of the war. Without application approval, they're forced to live off her parents' $500 a month pension and Oksana and her husband's generosity. We tried to apply for expediting work authorization and uh, they declined. No. They have two degrees, economics and musician, um, and uh, uh, in Ukraine I worked as a, man a manager position and uh, the head of uh, an unemployment agency, um, but here I don't care um, as long as I can uh, provide for my family and as long as I can be helpful here in America. Many refugees like Holovko and Kondira are volunteering in the war effort as a way to give back and connect with others in their new communities. She says thanks to Ukrainian Jersey City and her working being a volunteer, it still makes her feel like she's in, in Ukraine and that she's helping some way or another. So she said that's what makes her life easier. But if it wasn't for that, that it would be very, very hard because that's all you would think about. For some, New Jersey is starting to feel like home. I feel more, more comfortable. I feel like this is my home more than because in Ukraine, uh, when the war started, I felt not peaceful. I felt this is not my home. I can't be anywhere else. But after receiving financial aid to attend Montessori school, she says she now feels the support of the community around her. A lot of people want to help us and they understand the uh, situation. 
and yeah, the people here from USA, my friends are were helping me and they are helping me with English. Little Nicole is practicing her English too. What do you miss about your home? Shot is Ukraino. Um cat. Her cat. When she first got here, she was very scared. She wanted to talk to children, but she knew she couldn't. Now she feels like she can. Even in a park situation, she'll go up to a kid before it wasn't like that. And while these kids try to master the language, their parents are desperately waiting for approval to work so they can provide for their families. Ukrainian Jersey City says clothing, food, and monetary donations are still very much needed and appreciated. In Jersey City, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. And that does it for us this evening, but make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders, the caretakers of our historic landmarks, and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.